Well, hello, Dave. <laughs> How you doing, Nicole? Well, I'm having kind of a bad hair day, but other than that, I'm okay. You know, you, I don't get it. You say that all the time. Every time I look at you, I go, man, you look, you look doing fantastic. I think everyone else is the same thing. How great you look. I oh, think you look you. really no, good. I do not say that all the time because generally No, people my say that about is, you. People say that about me, that I have bad hair days. <laughs> no, that you're, you, how great you look. <laughs> that it's, She's a great girl and all that. Man, that hair. Um, <laughs> what a personality. <laughs> oh, can't get past the hair. <laughs> um no today i just i don't know this side has a mind of its own um anyways uh, <laughs> so you know listen i i it, i just keep reverting to cutting it more and more and more so i have a hair appointment and i'm like i think i'm going off i think i'm going even shorter just get is, rid of it the quicker it is to blow dry the the happier i am now we've talked about this before how you did it on baywatch how you just went boom cut your hair yeah. Now, when you did it, was it one of those where you were stressed out after you cut it, or is it liberating that, man, I, I just feel different. I feel like I'm in control. See, I don't take hair that seriously. It's hair, and it grows back. So, like, yeah. I mean, I've had really short hair. I've had long hair. I've had it all. It, it just comes right back. So, for me, I'm not, I don't, and I only get it done by people I trust. So, there's really not ever any, like, catastrophes. Um, I, I, I don't know. I think people are very serious about their hair, and I don't get that. But um, I guess I'm, I have good hair. I've always had good hair, though. So I'm, I, you know, talking from, yeah. <laughs> from kind you know, of a blessed spot. But I think it's usually women that, you know, obviously, you know, the hair as far as cutting it and making a major move for guys, and it's only how short you can cut it. I remember not all guys. Me. Some guys have not, very long hair. They they do. Some some do have long hair. Which I purpose. do not get. I, <laughs> I am not a fan. This is an embarrassing story, but around the time when I met you in the 80s, I always had short hair because I, I played sports and I wanted shorter hair. And then all of a sudden, half of my senior year, the last half of my senior year, I was just playing baseball and I said, I'm gonna grow it out. And I've oh. never had longer hair, but it was mullet time. So I went with the whole, you know, oh. the mullet move, which is which is bad, you know, business in the front party in the back. And I kept it for a couple of years and I was really proud of it at the time. <laughs> look, it, it wasn't ridiculous then, but at the time I was like, I'm doing it. You know, I couldn't believe I was growing my hair out. And then, you know, quickly I, I got married. And I cut it well, off. She cut it. She was like, no, no, it was shit. my, it was, oh. no, it was my idea to oh. cut it because I was like, these pictures are going to last forever. What if the mullet's <laughs> not in style? And thank God I cut it. But Facts. I remember Nicole, I remember sitting there when, she, when the lady was cutting my hair and I just started sweating. I was so upset that I had to cut my hair and, and I've never grown it back like that, but it was one of those where I've never done it. So when women go from long, let's say middle of their back to let's say the length you have, it's a it's a drastic decision to make. Okay, I have two things to say. One, Dave, what does your hair look like when it grows? Up? Like, does it need groom or is it just straight or is it a curl? No, like, what it what's goes curly. It, it, it goes, goes curly. curly. So, yeah, did I didn't you... cut my hair for one full year in 2020 during the pandemic. I just let it go for a year. So, in order to have a mullet, did you have like a curly mullet or it yeah. you straightened it or what was the no, deal? No, it was kind of curly. Okay, that's weird. I don't think that that really quite qual qualifies as a mullet. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, when it's buzzed on the side and short on top. Oh, yeah, it was it literally was... buzzed. On... I had a oh, yeah. I had a bit of a mullet myself. Chris McMillan gave me a um a cute little mullet when it was not on trend, and um I loved that. Um, I was this close to being Billy Ray Cyrus. <laughs> oh, achy breaky hair. Oh my God, Dave! I don't see it. I know. I don't You're never going to see pictures. You're never going to see pictures. Uh, no, I want to see pictures now. <laughs> now I need pictures. Because, you know, the mullet is back, though. I mean, people really are rocking that. Uh, or it was oh back gosh. last year. So. Uh, oh, yeah. my gosh. That's so funny. Yeah, I, I give you credit, though. You're you're brave. A lot of people will not do it. Or they cut their hair and they just start crying. I've seen women who just cry and hate it. That those, you know, Their hair is part of their identity. That's weird. Um, I remember one time cutting it from very long to super short and it feeling a little weird for a moment, like a day, yeah. but it's just like because something on my body completely changed. Um, but it's like so freeing and so amazing when the less hair you have, oh my God, the easier. In and out of the shower, much easier to rinse your hair. Yes. Out. 
And you know me, I'm like, you know, I don't put a lot of time and effort into to my glam. So the quicker it can get done, the happier I am. So that's, you know. I wonder if our guests ever had a mullet. We're going to have to ask him because he falls into that category that he might have. Um, I'm guessing yes. Many, I say yes. Uh, you're going to say yes? Okay, I think I'm so too. Yes. I'm kind of feeling like possibly. Um but we've got a great guest. You will all know him um, mostly from Family Ties as Skippy. He was in our in our <laughs> in our living rooms day after day for years, and he's just such an all around funny, good guy. So um, let me introduce Mark Price. Dave, Nicole, I have breaking news for you. This is no joke. Here, check this out. That's in Hollywood. Do you guys see? Oh. Is that a tornado? <laughs> <laughs> is that a, a dust devil? It's, a devil? What it's, is a, that? it's like a, it's a fire. It's billowing <gasps> smoke oh. from a building in Hollywood. It's probably just a fire. But in light of what's going on right now in the world, it is so freaky to see that, that is. in your hometown, knowing that the world is ablaze with World War III. Oh, no. Yes. It's a crazy new world we live in. You know, I went away this weekend and the war started. And when I came back, it all felt different at the airport. I bet. I bet. I, I, it's, it's, um, um, I'm just sort of sitting here with my mouth wide open. And you know what's surprisingly, what's surprising me the most is the um, the younger generations that are like pro this war. That's what I don't understand why so many me. people are are pro war other than the news every news channel whether it's republican or democratic or whatever party the news you know appeases it's uh they're everybody's pro war and they put all pro war people on and i think that helps lead the charge i don't know i mean but let's hope everybody's okay know. down there and let's hope it's a fire and everybody's safe it's disturbing right now because it is such a it's such a weird such a weird time and i don't i like i said i can't believe how many people like it brings all the dirt out of the woodworks you know what i mean it brings all the ugly icky people out of the woodworks and it's like um it's astonishing because i live in this world where i think everybody's you know so loving and encompassing and we're raising our kids this way and to me this new generation is so um all loving and all accepting and then when you see this and you see young people, um, oof, I don't know. Well, I'm Scary. Gen X. Are you guys, you're Gen X, right? Yeah. We, I should yeah. say we're Gen X. We're all Gen X. Yeah. Proud and, of it. Uh, and we love to complain about millennials. And our biggest complaint <laughs> is they complain too much, the skinny bastards. What do have to complain about? <laughs> no hair piece. No, I, I've Did never been married and I don't have any kids. Okay, but I did you ever have a mullet? But I did have a mullet, yes, of course. I think I led okay. the mullet charge, the nerdy mullet charge in the 80s of the of the, the show. I think that's what I, the short in the front, long in the back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think so too. Yeah, now that, yes. Now that I'm like picturing you on the show, yes, of course. Why was I ever even a question? Yes. <laughs> yes, you did. With the glasses. Um, Maybe not at the first. The big glasses. When I first showed up, that was pre pre mullet, you know, but then it, it evolved. Sneakers that I'm I'm pretty yeah, that, certain that would be the, very valuable. Back then, though, I'd held on to a couple of pairs. Oh, you did. We had uh, entree to the Nike store. I don't. You probably you you never had that. We had that. We could go to the Nike offices or whatever and just pick out shoes. I did. Also, Adidas. Adidas was very kind to me um, for many years. I had. I had an entire closet full of Adidas stuff. Um, yes, they don't do that anymore, really. <laughs> That's not really such a. Uh, <laughs> Isn't that us? They don't do that for anybody, or just us? Um, I mean, uh, probably just us. But no, I don't think they they do. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to be in a, a different kind of. <laughs> you have to be in a certain league to have that done. Now it's not. You know, it doesn't do them any good. But I think they let you shop in their like employee store, which is still still such an amazing deal but um yeah and I'm such a Nike fan I'm such a Nike and Adidas fan and then my daughter's like I want these I want these and she's showing and I'm sitting there going god damn it I had that in every color 
in her size that she's wearing now, I had everything and some of them were never worn. I was like, if I'd only kept everything, but what are you going to do? <laughs> In my uh, personal life, I, and maybe on the show too, I don't remember, but I like the ones that Michael J. Fox wore in Back to the Future. Not not the ones that uh, laced up on their own, the future ones. That that would have been very cool, but they didn't have those. But the kind he wore in the 80s. Yes, for sure. Um, so wait, do you, keep, do you keep in touch with him at all? Had a little, I think they had a, a burgundy, I think it had a burgundy swoosh. Well, what to do to get your hands on those right now? <laughs> I, I want those in my life. Where do we find those? In answer to your question, do I keep in touch with Michael J. Fox? Not all that much, but we did have a reunion not all that long ago where everybody got together. That was super cool. But oh. um, he's very appreciative because I raise money for the Michael J. Fox Foundation every stop on my tour. I recognize I go on tour a lot, Nicole. You know, I talked about Pittsburgh and Ohio last week, but next week it's Houston and somewhere Texas, and then it's Parker, Arizona, and Mesa, Arizona, and then I go to Toronto and Detroit and blah blah blah. And um, uh, I I wouldn't be doing that if it wasn't for him. I'm pretty convinced it's his charm and his star power that's in my proximity to him that even allows me that that gift of being able to tour the country. You know, that's people amazing. love that show. You know what? Because People love that show, but you were stood you stood alone for yourself. You you definitely are um, a character everybody loved. Um, when you talk about the Michael J. Fox Foundation, um, I just recently we were still shooting. We just are editing now, but um, a Baywatch documentary, and um, we are working with the Michael J. Fox Foundation because one of our lead lifeguards, um, Michael Newman. Um, has Parkinson's for the past 16 years and he's coming out with that. And we, we explore that and talk about it in the, in the documentary. And um, that was part of the deal is that um, some proceeds will go to that foundation. So yeah, very close to the heart. They're, they're very good about like, if you go to teamfox.org and you make nation 100% goes to research and so forth. None of that goes to salaries. They have other means of donations and things that take care of their salaries but even those they keep to like 20 percent of that side of it i'm not sure how it works exactly but i know they do a a, a really good job and they even just had a, a major breakthrough recently so that's they're fantastic. all very hopeful and excited over there oh good that, that's good to hear news. tell us about your um class in the creek did you say it was in a creek because i love a creek a, a class in a creek is that what you said? Didn't you say in a river or something? <laughs> Did you say that? No, I know what I said, uh, but it wasn't. I don't take any classes. I'm far. I, I graduate. I never graduated actually. But, but oh, I, I thought maybe you taught a class. I was with now. like that. You taught, oh, taught a class. A class. That yeah, would make right. sense. Yeah. Clearly, you don't know me very well. I'm, I'm not the uh, teacher type. Uh, but um, no, I like to go camping. Is what I said. And okay. so what we, we have a mutual friend, I guess it's fair, Dave, that we should share this. Uh, and that's Mindy and yeah. Mindy Molinari. Are we supposed to? We can share all day long. We love our Mindy. Full name and all that. I don't know. People going to yeah. stalk her now online. Um, <laughs> Maybe. And, uh, we love and, you, and she's, she's fantastic. And, and we work together. She helps me keep things organized with my tour schedule and stuff. She's kind of like my manager, my agent, my PR person, and my, you know, associate that runs the CEO of the company. She does it all. And so when uh, sometimes doing business, I love to go camping. And my favorite thing in the world is when I have my feet in the creek. See, there was the word creek involved. So you got that part right. Wait, so what's your favorite creek? Where do you go where you're guaranteed there's going to be water? <laughs> because that's not too far away. Because I love oh, a yeah. creek. Well, I love taking my kids, but. This last this last year, it's been it's been great for close places that are very pretty to LA in proximity. Um, you've got uh, two ways to go. You can go up to the Sequoias, which is you know like Yosemite's younger brother or whatever. It's a little smaller. It's a lot less crowded, and it's gorgeous. And I could give you all kinds of spots up in uh, the Sequoias. Um, there's uh, you know you go if desert camping in the winter. Have you ever done that? haven't i've you know what listen i've camped one time in my life. 
camped once. I, well, I never, I never desert camped in the winter before. I found a love for it during the pandemic uh, when we were all off and I couldn't go perform it or anything. And uh, yeah, we, they're up the 395, like on your way to Mammoth or Tahoe, that you've mm-hmm. gone up to Mammoth before? Yes. So yes, that road there. There's some amazing stuff just to the left of the 395. Incredible. Mount oh. Whitney, which is one of the highest, I th- think it might be the highest mountain in the United States. And, uh, you know, the, the, you go from the desert up into the mountains and it only takes like 10 minutes and it changes the weather. It's like that place in um, Palm Springs, right? Have you ever done that where you're like down in the desert and it's hot and then you take that gondola thing up and if you survive the gondola ride... Um, you are at like the highest point in Southern California or something like that. And whoo, cold and you are dizzy and all of those things. I'm at the highest point in Southern California right now in Hollywood, in Laurel Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> Take a look at that, guys. Yes. I lived in Laurel Canyon forever. I lived there for a long time. I miss it. You know about the rich rock and roll history of Laurel Canyon. Certainly do. Jim Morrison. You, uh, yeah. you know, uh, they, they, they wrote the song Desperado in part across the street from us. And this wow. property right here, this is the, where the doors live. The, the, uh, not the doors, sorry, the, the birds. The rock group, the birds. I was going to say Chris the doors, Hillman. they were down like down there on Laurel Place, huh? They were down there. Jim the Morrison flat. was right behind that, yeah. that country store. They yeah. Call the country Did store you the ever watch the, the movie preacher. Wonderland? Yes, yes. I've, I think I I've seen them all now. There's cool. a great movie about Laurel Canyon called Laurel Canyon. And uh, that one's with Francis McDormand, the fictional one. And then there's a few documentaries. Yeah, the documentary ones. Those are the ones that are scary, though. It's like, oh, <laughs> they're a little chilling. They're a little bit like, oh, I was living right there. Um, but yeah, such great history. Where So where are you headed next on, on the road? Like, I want By the way, I'm happy it. to report that that fire is completely out. Oh, good. We are Pick not. We are not a city at war. <laughs> Thank you, Captain um, Price. I guess the next place I go to is uh, Houston. Is that next? Houston and uh, at a place called Hungry Like the Wolf. Oh, I like <laughs> it's it. It's an eighty themed venue. And uh, where else am I going to be? Jo- the big ones to promote are Jokers in Toronto because we're having a big Michael J. Fox fan there. In November, I think it's Thursday, November sixteenth. I might might not have nailed that one. It's, uh, it's um, with myself, and it's the guy Steve Heitner who was on the show Seinfeld. He played Kenny Banya, the guy yeah. who says it's gold, Jerry Gold. Yeah, oh, I love that. Um, Mark, tell us something about like how did you land the role of Skippy, like? What was this? Did you get this interview? Because I remember what auditioning was like back then. Did you get this audition and you were like, you fit it or you had to work, like you had to create your character? Like, what? tell me about that process. Well, I was very young and you know how that goes. Sometimes uh, when you just show up in town or you're just starting your career, you got that like beginner's luck working for you. You know what I'm talking about. It's like, sure. you don't even know. You're, you're, you're far from bitter. <laughs> You've got <laughs> all the yeah, there's no jaded, all the hope in the world. Still- Nobody knows yet what's going to happen next. Like you could go on to the biggest star ever. They don't know. It's that that possibility is a very valuable thing. I tell newcomers that all the time. I go, that's you got to trade on that. Uh, anyway, I I did a couple. I got like a few sitcom roles. I did a commercial in the story. I got a few sitcom roles, little guest roles, and one of them was on Family Ties. So my first Skippy role, it was just a guest spot. It wasn't like everybody in town was up for it. It was just a one-time role in the first season of the show. And uh, they called me back to do another. And then in the meantime, I did a, uh, an episode of uh, Merv Griffin as a comedian. I was a little comedian kid. Did you know that? Well, I did know that you were um, on, you were a comedian, you are a comedian. I did know that because I also wanted to ask you about Last Comic Standing because that for me is like, um, I'd poop my pants. So um, we'll get to that. But yes, I did know you were a comic. Yes, I did know that. My my dad was a comedian. So I followed in his footsteps. I like to say we're both poor decision makers. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he, he taught me... Uh, 
you know, how to do stand up at a young age. I used to go on stage with him and stuff. And he was very popular. He had been on the Ed Sullivan show many times. And he was on the radio with Fred Allen in 1940. He was 50 when he had me. So he's no longer with us, but he was an older dad. But he he took time with me to to teach me about comedy and bring me to the comedy clubs as they opened and stuff. And so by the time I was fourteen, I went on the Merv Griffin shows. Like I was like a little Catskill comedian almost. And uh, NBC noticed it, and that's how it all kind of evolved because they they encouraged Family Ties to make me a bigger part of the show. You know. Oh, I love that. Nicole, one thing is, and again, I'm I'm not in the business like like you and Nicole are, Mark. But one of the things I always notice as a, a fan of TV and especially sitcoms is how hard it is to get the comedic timing down. And Family Ties was great at it. You were great at it because, boom, you got to walk through a door and you got to nail it at the right time. And and looking you up and reading about you, I was going to ask how much did your dad have to do with that as far as this is not just a joke. There, there's timing to that line and the, the, the delivery to have you ready to go to keep the scene moving. A lot of it was my dad and all the guys that I hung out with because of him. You know, I used to back, I, I would hang out backstage with George Burns or Milton Berle and guys like that and uh, bring them their tea and, you know, watch the show from the side of the stage and that kind of thing. So uh, that was the beginning of a great education. But what about Michael J. Fox and Meredith Baxter Burney and Michael Gross and even Justine Bateman was a natural, and uh, all, I'm going to mention every cast member now, and Tina others. They were all fantastic, and everybody, um, you know, I learned from them. That was, I would sit and watch them. I, I had a very small role on the show. I was the neighbor, remember that. So I had a lot of time to watch the main story before I was needed for my little appearance. And so I would I really, that was my college. I never went to school, never paid attention, never even, I dropped out of junior high, so. Well, listen, that you got the best school. school. You got the best school money cannot buy. Let's be honest. Like where you grew it up was, and who it, you grew up around. Like you couldn't it started you couldn't early. Purchase that. My dad's friend was the guy who played the grumpy dad on Laverne and Shirley, Mr. DeFazio, oh. if you remember that show. Of yeah, of course. course. And so yeah. I went to go visit when I was 12 years old. I went to Paramount Studios to visit him for the day. And he saw, I loved it so much. And I watched Laverne and Shirley work through a physical bit and figure out how they were going to do it. And I was just so enamored. And he saw that and he said, hey, you want to come back every day this week? And I was like, yeah. And he says, check everything out. And if anybody, you're Phil Foster's nephew, leave you alone. <laughs> now, oh. that's, this is pre 9-11. It would never happen anymore on a lot. But at that point, somehow, there I was just up oh, there's Mark and Mindy there's bosom buddies you know there's happy days you know I got to just watch it all and take it all in and Tom Hanks who nobody knew who he was yet from bosom buddies he uh, came over yeah. he saw a kid on the side watching so he juggled and did some shtick with me and everything it was such a thrill you know so that that set me up pretty wow. good for family ties by the time I auditioned at Paramount Studios I felt like I was you know already uh, used to it yeah I mean that that is like some serious knowledge, um, some insider knowledge that, um, and it, you know, it's like people don't get it. It's a formula, right? There, there's definitely a formula, and I think that a lot of people who probably like yourself, you more like just absorb it, right? It's a feeling. It's like it's the timing and the the all of it is more of um, a feeling, and either you have it or you don't, you know, and you had it. For what sure. was interesting about Family Ties is that the, they, the cast used to, uh, you know, rehearse throughout the week. You know the format well. You know it well. And uh, then on the Friday, we would do uh, two tapings. One like um, uh, one all day without an audience where they would just get, get it like a movie almost. They would just do it scene by scene. And if then something went wrong, they'd back up. They'd get it again. And it was just a real slow, arduous process. But then at the end of the day, they'd be like, okay, we can. Now just go let it fly. And then we do one in front of the audience at night. And that's the one they use like 90% of. They would only go back to the other if something went wrong or if they needed to cut something out and make it make sense. Or like they, most all of Family Ties is in front of the live audience. And uh, it would get, it got to the point where, cause everybody, you know, again, not me, I'm, I was just, you know, lucky to be up there with them, but they got so slick at it. Michael J. Fox. At all. He had all the lines, right? He had he had to remember a whole script every time. Uh, but he got so slick at it that they cut down the amount of time we did during the week to get to that taping because they didn't want to they didn't want us to go like they didn't want us to 
lose it too soon, so to speak. <laughs> so yeah, right. so they would, it gets uh, old. Yeah, it they gets cut out. A, they cut out a day. Like they just all of a sudden we were just doing you know Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You know. Wow, well, that's when you know you're a pro. <laughs> that's <laughs> when you know you're good. Yeah, you know it's well, like you say like your little part, but it's um it's those characters that make it refreshing and fun and um i i yeah who's the nerd on your it. show who is the skippy of your show there must have been a character well i think willie oh, ames Willi, Willi took Willi that Ames, on right, yeah. yeah and he kind of took and it, it came out of nowhere when he did that um because he wasn't like that before and then all of a sudden um but it it, it goes dark and deep with that so <laughs> I digress because um, <laughs> uh, I think there was there was a lot going on behind the scenes. But I think, yeah, I would say I think Willie was that for us. Right. Hey, hey Mark, I'd like to you thank mentioned... Hollywood for all the bad behavior that makes it very difficult for me as a uh, 80s sitcom uh, innocent character. Thank you, Bill Cosby. I like to say, because <laughs> no, I perform Thank you, Bill Cosby. Clubs. Thank you, Scott Baio. Thank you. Thank you so much. I go, I go to nightclubs because of Bill Cosby. Girls don't even want to touch their drinks. I have to. Uh, like, sure. For real. Hey, Mark, you mentioned uh, that there was a Family Ties reunion where everybody got together. As a, as a fan of the show, I was always curious when the show ended. I understand every, every show has its run, but... It's unusual for a show to be rated as highly as yours was to end. I believe at the time you guys were like the, still the number two show in the ratings, just behind the Cosby Show. And then there were you know all these rumors that Meredith Baxter Bernie was jealous of Michael J. Fox, and that's not the way the okay, show was so supposed rumors, to be. Not true. Everybody to be the was of course. Panic about Michael J. Fox. Everybody loved Michael J. Fox. Everybody loved the fact that he was the biggest star in the world. Everybody knew that was the, the you know, the thing that, you know, everybody was ecstatic about that. I promise you that. There was nobody that was upset that he was as good as he was and that everybody gravitated towards him. Like, that was that was the greatest thing ever for our show. Um, but the secret that you might not realize, that most people don't realize, most people think exactly what you just said. But really what happened was we were on after Cosby and we were, like, the number two. They were number one. We were number two. It was, you know amazing ratings and a lot of times what they do at that point is they take the second show and they give it its own night they make it the lead-in for its own night in order to try to make another night a big night you know thursday night was the big night and so they put us on sunday night and we were on opposite murder she wrote uh. and every everybody was cocky we thought oh we got this old lady beat we got michael j fox <laughs> No. And, and, and our ratings tanked our ratings were like way down when they but i i know that kind of made it like the show canceled them and all that stuff but the ratings were not uh, not what they were at the by the time it ended but they they kind of say it at that we don't want to take it to the because a lot of shows when they go to that 12th year or whatever it's kind of a it's never the same as it used to be you know how that goes yeah they what a terrible jump into the shark, right? Isn't that the famous? Yeah, well, you had to follow. Think about it. CBS had sixty minutes, and then Murder She Wrote. You got, you had no chance. You had no chance. <laughs> we yeah. thought we did. We thought we had better than a chance. We thought we were going to take them down, like like wrestlers. <laughs> that was some poor decision making. Yeah, somebody somebody really dropped the ball right there. So, wait. So um, tell well, me I about. Think... Last comic standing. Wait, there was another, there was another aspect of it too, which is that the, the Cosby Show producers, uh, Carsey Warner, they had other shows too, and they wanted one of their shows to go after Cosby. They didn't want somebody else. They wanted to. They right. wanted to reap the, the, the their own success. And they had lots of shows. So anyway, that was part of it too. So there was all these alternative, uh, ulterior motives, basically. But what a great time! I never. Um, do anything but look back with um, the fond memories of, uh, you know, just being a part of it. And, you know, people ask, oh, do you make a lot of money now from it and all that stuff? And I don't, you know how that goes. It's not a lot of money anymore. No, it's just the, but how the can memory. I complain if there's any money at all from something back then, who, who else gets paid from their, their job in the eighties, you know? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. But who, like gave as much oh yeah, as I just got life. my check from Denny's for four dollars from the eighties when I used to work there. <laughs> you know. So I, I, that's 
that's one of the things that we're striking about right now is to get paid for like the streaming platforms don't pay anything to the actors. Is that true? No, I get paid for it. Um, but I also, uh, when I was on Baywatch, uh, the cast and I, we all did like a class action lawsuit early on when streaming first became a thing. So I don't know if it's because of that lawsuit that we get paid or if we're actually like getting, you know, money out, but it's, you know, it's, it's just funny because I'll, I'll get a stack of checks in the mail and I'm like, Oh, somebody's streaming the show and they will be like great paychecks. And I'm like excited and I'm stoked. And then other times I'll get a stack of them. Then they're like for four fucking cents. Yeah. I don't know and if I'm the like, average. I want to American put it back in the mailbox, like return to sender, return to sender, return to sender. Um, so they spend you know, more on the stamps than they do sometimes yes. on the actual check. Yeah, that's what I say. Like the ink, the envelope, the stamp. This all has already way bigger than the than the check. And then never mind everybody's time. Um, yeah, so none of that makes any sense. Even my my 12-year-old said to me, why wouldn't they just keep all the checks and then write $1 check? <laughs> like, write a check and when it becomes dollars, why are they writing checks for cents? And I was like, I don't know. don't know. I can't answer that. It's bizarre. Donate it. Just donate it to charity or something. Right. Or you is there, is there still things. that bar? There's cents. that bar Donate. residuals, right? Is, is there's there's there a bar in Studio City called Residuals? It was around when I was a kid. I oh, was too funny. young to go in there. And if you had a residual, you know what? Chat, I saw it. It's at a different location. I saw it recently. It's still going. Oh, you a did? Location. It's still. I love that. It's still around. It's, so you would take your residual check, and you could get a drink free if you if you signed over your residual check to them no matter what the amount of it is so it was like this actors hangout but i was too young to be part of the club i'm not too young now you'd have to sign it over <laughs> to them i think they hung up on the wall you think what they hung them up on the wall i think they yes. hung them up on the wall there they have a collection of them yeah yeah because they were all right guys the restaurant okay are you are you done with us? You you you. No 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 no. I, I don't know. Is okay. there how? <laughs> Casper Casper. Casper wants to go to the park. Mark is done with us. We're all no, headed no, no. to residuals. I, I'm... Mark, I'll meet you there in about twenty minutes. Um, <laughs> Mark, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story and your your good energy. We love you and um, continued you. success on the road. Thank you and. Um, we, we definitely, uh, want to, anybody want to check out the Michael J. Fox foundation, Mark's upcoming shows. Um, all of it is good stuff. They, you know, where they go is I joke.com. I J O K E.com. I joke.com. That takes you there to you what I'm it. up to and all the different upcoming stuff. And Dave, thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you and Nicole. Pleasure meeting you. Wonderful. You're always an inspiration. You always make things Thank happen. You you're a happy you, you make things happen i do i feel okay thank you i'll, I'll take that compliment i will i will it's, it's inspirational I will it's take that compliment thank you that's kind thank you mark love your guts <laughs> that's the opposite of hate your guts it's a very loving positive thing. love your guts love your gut love your face love your guts <laughs> oh my goodness Oh my I gosh, always say that. That's full. funny that he just said that because I always say that to people, my friends and stuff. Okay, okay, I love your guts, or I need to see your face. Um, oh my gosh, he's a that good guy. A, oh, he's a really good guy. You know what's interesting is when I've, ever I've watched him, and whether he's doing comedy or he's you know doing a sitcom, he always has a ton of energy. And I've always noticed that even yeah. Nicole, when I used to you know go to <laughs> tapings of Charles in Charge, when I would see you, and I would say everyone on the set has so much energy. And then I, you know, everyone who sits in the in the crowd that watches a live show, they run through their mind at some point. Could I do what they do? And when you see that energy and and the way that you're able to bring it out, I understand it. It's part of the job, and that's not the way you know you are all the time. It's exhausting to be that way, but it's it's really it's a skill that a lot of people don't have. Well, uh, you know what I'll say to that is that the audience actually brings that energy. So you're just feeding off what you're given. And um, that's a reason like I love doing um, plays and um, sitcom TV shows. Uh, 
it's my favorite thing to do because you you feed off that energy. It's not I, I didn't make that energy. I was given that energy by you, the audience. And um, when you can feel that, it's it's a special thing because you might be exhausted as you know, I mean, I definitely was exhausted. Um, come show day and tape day. And um, you walk out there and people are so happy to see you and they're for you and so and they want it to be funny and they're laughing. And um, I don't know, it gives it life. You know, it's like that second, yeah. third wind that just um, naturally happens. So that's not something I manufactured. That's something that was given to me by the audience. You know, so when you do things in front of a live studio audience, and there aren't a lot of shows that are like that anymore. You know, it used to be there are a ton of them like that. When you're doing it through a live studio audience, when you're there and you guys say a line that's supposed to get a laugh, can you tell when the energy is really there, like the audience thinks that that's funny, or do you feel like at times, all right, the audience knows they're supposed to laugh now and it feels kind of fake? Does that, like, I imagine the producers feel it. They know. Okay, so, you know, way back in the day, like when I was doing it, um, it was organic. So either they laughed or they didn't. And um, and then I knew if a joke worked or it didn't. And sometimes um, the writers would have a backup joke on hand. Like, so, yeah. so say it didn't work, then we try a different one. That didn't happen very often, honestly, because when you're in a moment and you're sharing an energy with a room like that full of, and those audiences were quite large, you know, yeah. uh, it's not also not like it is now. They were, there was a lot of people there. So um, it was a lot of energy in one room. And, um, and then I think later they came up with like that applause, like uh, people like I, I know that if you would go to a, a talk show or something like that, you would have somebody telling people like when to laugh, when to clap. There would be like an applause light. It would literally read out applause and it would flash. That's when it becomes, you know, manufactured and not as genuine. But yeah. we didn't have that. That that wasn't I was lucky enough to be part of something that was very organic and very natural and very bare bones and just real, you know? Yeah. So um, there's nothing like that. It's like I did a play at the Mark Taper Forum when I was a kid. And I got to tell you, it's like there is nothing like that energy. Uh, and the Mark Taper Forum is a bigger venue than what Charles in Charge was. So to have all that energy too, it's like um, it can move you. It can move you to tears. It can move you to like – um, this amazing feeling. This is why I know that a lot of, um, I can relate when a lot of musicians like say, well, they're up here when they're performing, like they're doing a, a, a performance. Right. And then there's this huge crash when they're like alone on their bus, you know, moving to the next destination because it is so invigorating. It is such a high, it is such a feeling. Um, it's undeniable. So, you know, I just, I don't know. I was lucky enough to to experience it in my life. So I just feel like, you know, for somebody who's not an attention seeker, I'm really not. Yeah. Um, I can say, I can genuinely say I appreciate the energy of a group of people together, all rooting for the same thing, wanting the same thing. I guess it's sort of like a a, a game, like for you, when you go to a, a baseball game or a basketball yeah. game or a football game, whatever it is, when you're sitting on the side of that team and everybody's rooting, you know, and, and there's just that genuine um, energy and energy is very real. It's a, it's a real thing. So I agree. There's nothing like it. Yeah. I, I agree. We're just curious when you're doing a, a play compared to doing a, a television show, a sitcom, where if you mess up in a sitcom to cut it, let's, let's do that scene again and play. There's none of that. There's no eraser. You know, we there's don't go no back. Eraser. So when you do a play or the first time you had to do a play, were you nervous? Were you going, man, I gotta, I gotta get this right. Like be a hundred percent perfect. Yes. It was very, very, and you know, my first like live play that I did was such a big venue and it was a Jules Pfeiffer play who's, you know, world renowned. It was a big deal. There was a huge, it was a celebrity star studded cast. I was actually the understudy for the girl. Um, and she was cast in Annie and left, left the show and I had to take over. And it's like, that's so rare. Like it just was meant to be. And it was yeah. so rare. But I was like, oh, all of a sudden I was like, <laughs> now I have to pay attention. Um, 
and again, you know, it's like I was still in school, so I'd be doing school, and then in, um, in the play, it, the Mark Taper, there would be um, much like how it is on soaps and um, some sitcom shows and talk shows. There's like a little um, speaker that comes through and it says, you're up, so-and-so, you're up, or so-and-so, get backstage. And so um, it was my first experience with that. And man, that timing is real because like you said, there's no cutting, there's no stopping. There's a live audience out there. And if you're late for your queue or your entrance or whatever, you're really messing everything up. And I remember when we closed out the show, we got a standing ovation. And I remember just holding it together as we did our bows on the stage and then losing it and just crying my eyes out. And it was like happy, happy tears, yeah. but it is that level of like energy and emotion. It, it It's really, um, it, it's overwhelming and uh, it's wonderful. Mm. It's just such a good, it's, it's just such a good thing. I'm just so blessed that, cause I wouldn't do that now. Yeah. You want to do a play? I, you mean? I, 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 I don't, I'm not saying I wouldn't do a play, but like to step out onto a, a stage at the at the music center in downtown LA. Um, I'm not so sure. That's scary. That's scary boots. <laughs> that's, um, <laughs> uh, that's it's a big undertaking. It's a big yeah. deal. People pay a lot of money. There's a lot of critics. It's a lot. There's a lot going on in that. So um, it's a big responsibility. And I just, you know, I was a kid. So um I didn't, I didn't, um, all of that wasn't actualized for me. I wasn't, you know, fully aware of how major that was. Now I am. And now I would pee my pants on the stage and it would be embarrassing. And, um, I just don't know. I don't know if I, I mean, I guess I could do it. Of course I could do it, but you know, it's just a different mindset. It's now when you know, like how major something is, it, it brings on a whole other fear factor. You know, you just said something that we've never spoken about on the show as far as critics go. Like, you know, everybody has an opinion. And then yeah. when you have people, their their job is to basically, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. And and we know they get, you know, more publicity towards what they're doing if it's a thumbs down. It doesn't matter whose feelings they hurt. Have you ever looked to see what somebody said about a project you were in or do you stay away from it? Um, I stay away from it because um, I already know I suck. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> you just look at it that way you're, just, you're able to just clear I, your I, mind i bombed it's all good anything oh anybody gosh. has anything positive to say then hey let's celebrate but um you know i'm gonna take it as like you know everything i do is a fail um no i i just don't because also you know that's all very political too and and ratings and um I don't know. I, I I just it's like you can't please anybody. And sometimes when you get horrible ratings and horrible reviews, um, it's more successful. Yeah. So, so like you know, that's true. That's true. All right. So I have another one for you, which I almost I bet I can guess the answer. I'm gonna guess you're a person that never Google's themselves. Um. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, I have Googled myself, though. I made the mistake because um, when the whole thing about me speaking out against my abuser came out, um, I was really kind of sad that he was able to hire somebody um, that's like, you know, can run a smear campaign and they call it a crisis manager. And so they can, you know, people can change what comes up in your Google search. It's a monetary yeah. thing. You know, yeah. this is a, a thing that can be bought and sold. And um, I don't know what it's at right now because I haven't done it lately. Please don't do it. <laughs> now that we're talking about it, I don't encourage it. Um, but I would I did it a couple times and the stuff that came up was just so like um, it was so much more of the abuser abusing and yeah. i yeah and i i just was heartbroken you know because i stand on my own and i i have a career and i've had a a, a life and i've done a lot of good things and um you know to be to be searched up and then you get all this like negative shit that's like he they like edited videos you know have you ever seen that thing where like they turn forrest gump into a horror movie by editing it no i haven't Okay, it's shame. genius. No. 
it's genius. I love Forrest you, Gump. Yeah. Okay. I so do I. I'm a huge fan. Well, anyways, the, some an editor edits this little quick 30 second video and they make it a horror film rather than the wonderful story that it is, right? And it just is like it's a show of the power of editing. Um wow. and would just plaster them everywhere. And that was what was coming up when I would Google myself. So it was just disheartening. And, um, you know, I, I don't know what else to say about it. It it, it just, it, it, I, I didn't need to do it. I, I'm not going to do it. Um, and, you know, it goes away. It does eventually go away and other things pop up. But, you know, that's, if you're a masochist, go ahead, Google. <laughs> Google yourself. <laughs> You know, the reason I asked you that question was, I imagine there are people out there that are, are curious to know what people think about them or whatever else. What was So for someone like me who just did basically local radio, did some national radio, everything in there about me, I'd, I'd say 50% of it is false. And it yeah. bothered me that not the fact that anyone would, you know, who dislikes the fact I like the Dodgers, or is it going to write something, you know, terrible to me? That that doesn't hurt my feelings. But I wouldn't want my kids to look at and look at it, which I'm sure they have, and think this is correct. And hopefully they would come to me and ask any questions, which my kids have done in the past. But it bothers me that you have to defend your life when it's not accurate. And I imagine you on a much larger stage has to defend their life when it's it just it's ridiculous. You know, it's frustrating. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I have so many thoughts on this because it's like, do people really take it seriously what they read when they Google it? Um, how much of it do they really retain and do they really judge you on it, whether it's true information or false information? I'm not really sure anybody really cares what they're saying. People already have their preconceived notions of you. You're right. Um, just like they'll forgive an abuser because they love them so much, right? And they hold them yeah. in their heart in a certain place and they can't imagine that this person would have done something so bad, right? So yeah. Believe the negative. So it's sort of that same thing too. It's like people will believe what they want to believe. Um, and there's so much misinformation on the internet. We talked about this before. I mean, even when it comes down to like my financials and my life and like what I've done and chosen to do with my money, it's so much of it is so false out there. And at the end of the day, it's nobody's fucking business. Exactly. Exactly. So like, I don't know. I don't even know why you're looking it up or reading about it. Does it make you feel better? Great. If like, uh, if a sad story about me makes you feel better about yourself, then have at it. Um, you know, you know, I'll I say am. this, <laughs> I'll say this. I've never, I've never Googled you before. And you know why? Because I, as I tell people, I, I know her, I don't need to Google her. I know who she is as a person. Number one, two is I know what's wrong. What's false about me. I can't imagine what's false about her. I'm not, I'm never going to Google you. It's not I've fair never Googled to you. you either. I wouldn't go. I, 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 <laughs> I will occasionally Google my kids just to see yeah. like what is really out there. Um, yeah. And that's more of like a mama bear um, security thing than it is anything else. Um, exactly. I, I'll do that, but I don't really, I don't really Google people. Nothing yeah. is even, you know, nothing's like valid. Anyways, it's like we we already know IMDb is full of crap most of the time. Um, Wikipedia, you can go on there and change it. Although I do find Wikipedia to be a little bit more reliable than IMDb. Um, but you know, you can go on there and make edits yourself. It's just, you know, and listen, it's like, you know, you know, who's got anything to prove? I don't have anything to prove. I, I like, if you're not paying my bills, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're not awesome. paying my bills you're not cleaning my toilet you're not coming over yeah. here and cooking in my kitchen then you know <laughs> see your way out of it like you know what is it what does it have to do with you but the one the one that the one that got me with my youngest son was i i signed a new contract at one point and my son says i know how much money you make and we can afford it for you to buy me <laughs> this and i was like well that money's wrong one, that's a lot more money than I'm getting. Two is I'm even if I did make that money, I'm not spending it on you. But he like had his list of this is what we're buying yeah, for me, and I was it. like, yeah, okay, <laughs> that's not happening. But that was, I, but you know what? Is as upset as I was that the money was wrong in the in what he googled. What made me laugh was I would have been more upset if it was wrong the other way. Let's say I was making <laughs> a lot more and it was a lot less, and I'd go, this sucks. Then I probably would have had to go out there and make it public. 
I make a lot more than that. But the fact it was, it was so much higher than the other way that I, you know, it was just a conversation in the house about his wish list wasn't going to happen. But yeah, it, it's, it's true. You're right. It's unless they're paying your bills and, and going in your house and cleaning and, and cooking F off. I, it doesn't yeah. matter. I don't get any you're energy. My from gas us. Tank. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm not, with you. Yeah. Get out of here. Oh my gosh. All right. I got to ask you as we move on into, you know, what you're watching because there are two things I got to ask you about. Okay. Real Housewives of New York coming to an end. And yeah. for me, I, I was very disappointed in the season. Almost like nothing happened. Nothing happened. And, and I thought the casting was bad, even though everyone's saying, you know, I'd say everyone, you're hearing a lot of people say, oh, the casting was great. Where? I just didn't think the casting was great at all. And for someone who watches shows like I do, and you watch more of them than I do, am I wrong? Was, was this a bad season? No, it was bad. And you know what I think is that maybe Jen and U are really too, like, um, like I would say, like people that are New Yorkers that I would be interested in because they've got that fabulous lifestyle and they are, you know, doing fabulous things. Because listen, we watch this show to like um, see what other people are doing in their lives, right? It, we don't want like the mundane every day. Um, I, it's just so weird. And all these people hung up on that woman's husband using the miles to go to <laughs> Vietnam. Vietnam. <laughs> what what part do they not get of that? It was the the ticket cost him nine hundred dollars. If anybody was paying attention, it's a ten to twenty thousand dollar ticket that he paid nine hundred dollars for. It is a first class trip to Vietnam from the United. States. You know how many miles he's going to get for that? It's a big, <laughs> it's a big deal, and he's right. I guess nobody's ever done the first class. You know, sit in the pod. You have your own bed. You have your own bed and your TV and all the accoutrement. And they are feeding you and topping you off. And life, hours go by like this. My trips <laughs> to New York, when I fly first class in the pod to New York, I'm yeah. like, oh, wait, we're here? You know, opposed <laughs> to like being a coach when you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> How much more time? Like, you know, like a whole nother movie. It's it's such a, a day and night experience. Like it's just there's no comparison. So I wish they would lay off this poor man. I'm sure he's really <laughs> literally gonna get a sandwich and come back. He can get a hooker in the United States, people. He's not going to be a mom <laughs> for a hooker. Get over it. Oh, that's Jeez true. Louise, you know? That's true. And All the, he did the, go down to Atlantic City. <laughs> he's got Atlantic City right that's there. That's true. So, yeah. That, that's true. The Utah one, just as, as the seasons have, have just started, you know, we're about four or five episodes in on Utah. Do you like the direction of that show? I mean, I think it's the star. I think it's the shining star of the franchise. I just walked, I just watched Mary Cosby on Watch What Happens Live. I think it was last night. I mean, she, zero Fs given. Zero. Yeah. She doesn't care. She doesn't really even know what's going on. She doesn't know what talking about ever and um they've quoted her it's like who said that and they're like you you said that and she's like oh <laughs> completely vacant completely vacant um she's a strange cat she is she's, she's a strange cat yeah she's awkward she's awkward yeah. she's hard to watch um she makes me you uncomfortable know, i hated her three weeks ago and was really upset they brought her back and now she's so bizarre I don't so mind bizarre. her being there. When she was starving the other day and she ordered the food and she was rude to everybody and then the girl next to her tells her what to get on the pizza and she just order your own. Like she wasn't going to share. You know, she well, tells the driver she says, the sprinter man take one of her yeah. yeah. No, yeah. Okay, so yes. And isn't it the same girl she just criticized about eating a crepe and she told her she like you much. need nutrients, right? Like she fat shamed her. And then yeah, um, and, and then she says, I want a pizza to go. And as she's telling the waiter that, or the server that he's lazy because he didn't put her pizza in a pizza box to go, yeah. the other one is like, oh, that's not a bad idea. I want one. And she's like, get your own. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> she doesn't care. She doesn't care about anybody, anybody's feelings. Any, she no. doesn't care about saving face in any way, shape, or form. It's, it's quite, it, it's. <laughs> It's How about when she said, I wasted, an, I wasted another outfit on this? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I said that when I was, like, 19. I used to say that. Yeah. Like, 
we'd go out and the party would be like bonk and you know like not that good and be like ah good outfit wasted i mean that is like, <laughs> who says that anymore but i mean yeah she's wild but her hair has gotten better her wigs have gotten better at least so at least she can like talk the shit because in that first season she couldn't talk any shit those no. wigs were so bad um yeah weird i love it i love it i think meredith is off her rocker she um is. really off her rocker right like and that accent comes out again and i'm like is she drinking or is that just what happens what's going on um and she's kind of a bully she's a bit she of is. a bully isn't she very much so yeah. Very much so. I don't like when it. she told the, like when she told the story about the car accident, that you're thinking something horrible happened, like she's showing her friend and thinking someone died in this car accident, and she's telling the story, and then you hear we just crashed into a snowbank, which looks like when they show show it, looks like they drove into a pillow. Yeah. And oh, it changed my life. It was life changing, and I'm like, that was the worst story I've ever heard. Like, what, what are you talking? There was nothing to the story. I mean, if she can have a come to Jesus moment, I'm happy for her. <laughs> <laughs> she is a strange strange woman she might need a few more that's all yeah <laughs> that's, that's all all right let's get to uh your mailbag how's that okay all right nicole's mailbag again perfectly twisted pod.com you have a question for nicole and we we have a bunch of them coming in we're going to try and get to as many as we can but people have been great on uh sending questions in so we're gonna try and bring them up when we can uh this one's from jackie h it says nicole were you a fan of the tv show lost I never watched it. I've never seen it. I didn't either. I didn't either. All nope. right. Good. I, I don't feel never like an idiot. Nope. <laughs> if you don't watch it, I'm glad I watched it. That's how I feel. Mm -mm. I've never seen it. All uh, right. I'm sorry, Jackie. Now there's no opinion. I know. On sorry. Right. Here we go. Uh, this is again, Jackie. Uh, Nicole was um, buddy Willie Ames on Charles in Charge funny in real life, or was he only funny on the show? Uh, um... Okay, this is touchy. This is weird. I guess only funny on the show. He's a very serious guy. Really? Like, yeah. Super serious. Um, and, you know, that character Buddy wasn't so quirky and so funny in the beginning. He was, he was pretty normal and, like, straight. And then he changed up um, his deliveries and his comedic, like, timing. Everything changed. Um. You know, there's a whole weird war between him and Scott Baio, and um, they they never got along. It was never a happy, comfortable place on set between those two. And then uh, that's wild because I think a now, lot of people thought those two were best friends off camera. Terrible, no, not at all. Wow, uh, very uncomfortable to be around. Um, and then you know. And and the whole thing came out where Alexander Plinsky and I spoke out against Scott and told about some of the things that happened on set. And Willie was there. He was like, um, I'm going to be there. I'm going to speak for you guys. And then Scott Baio made up this this fabricated story that there was going to be a reunion, uh, a Charles in Charge reunion, which was never a thing. And um, Willie like jumped ship and went on Scott's side. And then Scott turned around and said Willie was the one abusing the kids. Ooh. So I, I I I stand far away from this. I know what happened to me. I know what happened to Alexander. Um, I know what I saw. I know what I experienced. What they you know going back and forth at each other about, that's between them, but they are horrible enemies. Those two. Oh wow. Yeah. I think that's very surprising to a lot of people, at least even to me, because I remember them they did a movie called Zapped Together. Yeah. And so yeah. then it goes into the TV show and I'm thinking, well, if they work together in the movies and on TV, they must be great friends. Yeah. I had no idea either. No. All right. No, 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 next no. question for you. David Charvet seemed like uh, such a nice guy on Baywatch. Did you ever date him? <laughs> no. No, 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 no. <laughs> no to both. Um, no. And um, no to both. I knew, I knew David for years. David and I knew each other way before Baywatch. So we were friends. Um, you know, David Chervais is a character. He's definitely a very confident guy. And um, no. I'll leave it there. 
was he was he uh, okay you said no to both meaning who was he not a nice guy i'm gonna leave it there okay we'll leave it there all right we'll we'll take it for that all right emilio roberts wants to say Listen, he's ever... not a bad guy i i i, I okay. let me okay. let me clear that up yeah yeah he's yeah, not yeah. a bad guy is he the nicest guy no but is he like a bad guy no definitely not okay. so let me clear that up yeah Okay, I'm glad you said that then, because yeah. <laughs> that, would, that would have backfired. All no, right, no, good. No, not I'm glad guy. you. I'm glad you said that. I got it. He's also not helping old ladies across the street, but he's not I, a bad guy. No, not at all. Right. Okay, Amelia Roberts asked, "Did you ever experience a midlife crisis?" Oh, oh, oh. I mean, I might be right now. Now you just put me in the one. <laughs> Did you ever think in your mind, like I, I went through that, I didn't do it, but I went through that, I'm going to buy a motorcycle face. You know, I, I didn't, but at the same time, I didn't think I was going through a midlife crisis, but the fact that I was going to buy a motorcycle, meaning I was wanting to change. What, did you ever go through a phase of saying, I'm going to do something completely out of my norm? I mean, I don't live a normal life. So like no, going true. out of the norm is like, what do you, I, I, I for me to do something normal, be outrageous. Um, no, I don't think so. And you know what? I've been a mom. I've been a mom of young girls. So it's like if I were to go off the ledge, where would that leave them? So maybe um, I have one coming up. I'll schedule one <laughs> in the next three years. Well, I hope you do. That means you're going to live to about 106. So I hope you, I hope well, you do. <laughs> yeah, if I can get my retirement, my pension fund, um, and then my kids can take care of themselves. Well, my oldest does take care of herself. She's a very independent, strong young lady. Um, but when my youngest is then taking care of herself, then I can go off the scale. Yeah. They, they but no go. motorcycles. Right. There won't be a motorcycle. There might be a convertible no. Porsche or something, but not a motorcycle. <laughs> you there might funny, be a beach house. See- there might be yeah. a beach house. There might be a Porsche. I don't know. I just had this conversation with my son the other day about convertibles. How they used to be all over the place, and now you don't see a bunch of them. I think because of skin cancer. But you remember, there were convertibles everywhere when we were growing up. Or they're just the most annoying things in the world. That's like I, I, I hate wind. Okay, like I'm. I, and as I'm saying this, I am watching the Santa Anas come in right now, and my trees are like hitting the windows. Things are starting to happen outside. I hate wind. I don't like it. So I'm not Me a too. big convertible person. It's not, yeah. I like it for a look. <laughs> I don't like it yeah. for the feeling. When so, it's um, in the driveway. But there are, did you see those new Jeeps have come out with those really cool soft tops that move back and forth? Yeah. The Broncos too, cool. I think have it. And they're doing this like half where it's like the back half of the car opens up. I don't know. No, I'm it's not a big rally. convertible person, but I do love a convertible Porsche. I saw this go. guy dr- driving a 87 Porsche Carrera the other day. Where do, do you remember where just like two little windows like was, would come was, off? My dad had that car. Oh, yeah, with that, that target top. Gold. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Gold. Loved it. Yep. Oh my God. I was I wanted to, and it was that like um old school yellowish beige color. Oh my God. Yeah. I was like, I it's want funny. Your my dad car. had a my, my dad had a yellow Porsche. That's funny as hell that you just said that. Oh, that's a class. I love that car. Yeah. And then when I got my driver's license, he sold it. So there's no way I'm going to let you drive this car. <laughs> yeah. Like. Yeah, that was it. That was it. All right, last question for you. We'll get you out of here. Did uh, you enjoy doing this show, What Not to Wear? <laughs> um, No. Um, So, you know, like most reality shows, it's very produced. It's heavily scripted. It's all of these things. And you basically set yourself up to, like, be ridiculed. And in return, you get like a full, you get a paycheck, A. Okay. You get a trip and you get a full new brand new wardrobe, you know, oh, wow. complimentary wardrobe. So it's like you do it for those kinds of perks and those kinds of things. You don't do it because um, it's fun. Yeah. No, for people to sit there and tell you you look crazy. But then it's also like, you know, there is some fun to it to going like, okay, what are my bad outfits going to look like? Yeah. You know, what am I going to do to like, um, cause they shoot this like stuff beforehand of like your terrible outfits and what bad style you have. So that's fun to make that up and do that. Um, easy fun. I don't know. These shows are funny. Reality TV is funny. Yeah. I don't know, but you know, yes and no with that show. Okay. Good deal. 
Good deal. All right. So again, if you want to get a question in perfectly twisted pod.com, look for Nicole's mailbag. You can ask a question and we'll try to do our best to get it on the show. There we go. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for the good questions. And I appreciate them. Don't forget to subscribe, uh, rate, review all the good stuff. Let us know what you're thinking and you all have an amazing week. Make it a good one.